Welcome to BCRF Zoom. I'm Margaret Flowers, and I'm joined today by Dr. Julie Grelo from the University of Washington. We've asked Dr. Grelo to join us today to speak to us about an important study that is re reporting results at the uh, San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, which happens, which is this year happening virtually. Dr. Grelo, I'd like to ask by um, to begin by asking you to just introduce yourself to our audience. I'm the Jill Bennett Endowed Professor of Breast Medical Oncology at the University of Washington, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and uh, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And effective February 15th, I will be the Chief Medical Officer at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Well, congratulations on that move. That's very exciting mm -hmm. and uh, very good news for ASCO for sure. Um, the study that we're talking about is called Rx Ponder. And it was conducted by the Swag Cancer Research Network, a very large network of uh, clinical trialists. And the results that are being presented at SABCS build on results reported last year in 2019 from the Taylor X study, um, also conducted by a, a large cooperative group called ECOG Akron. And I'd like to begin um, by asking you to compare and contrast the two studies for us. Both studies involve using a genomic assay, uh, we call it the 21 gene recurrence score, uh, which was an assay that was really developed to figure out which of our estrogen receptor positive, our hormone responsive uh, breast cancer patients didn't need chemotherapy. So we had gotten to a point in about 2000, 2001, where we had all these studies showing benefit of chemotherapy in postmenopausal and premenopausal women, and we didn't know who not to give chemotherapy to. So we actually had consensus guidelines back about 20 years ago saying, because we can't figure out who doesn't benefit from chemo, we should give chemotherapy to everybody. And of course, as soon as that recommendation was made, we all knew it was wrong. So the 21 gene recurrence score assay was developed using some older trials where we knew the features of the tumor, we had tumor blocks, we knew the outcomes, we knew who had recurred and who had died. We knew you know, through these trials who had gotten chemotherapy and who hadn't in a randomized way. And this assay, uh, first, in a retrospective way, showed that we could pick out lymph node negative patients, some of our lowest risk patients whose tumors expressed the estrogen receptor, but not the HER2 receptor, who did just fine without chemo. And then the Taylor X trial that uh, was run by the ecog Akron group, uh, a big national cancer trials group supported by the National Cancer Institute, that looked at the lymph node positive population, but in a prospective way. So we had developed this assay when we already knew what the outcomes were, but now we had to test it in a prospective way to see if we assign therapy based on using this recurrence score that we got the same excellent outcomes, you know, uh, without the chemo chemotherapy. And then that Taylor X tried to define an intermediate risk group um, and look at who benefited, who didn't. And what Taylor X showed importantly was using a cut point of the age of 50, we saw some different results that the older patients, generally postmenopausal, uh, we could go to a higher recurrence score without seeing benefit from chemo. But in the younger population under 50, we did see some evidence of chemotherapy benefit to lower scores. So that's the background. The RX Sponder trial was then a trial where we said, if this holds up in our lymph node negative patients, uh, is the same true if you have one to three positive lymph nodes involved. So the cancer has clearly already started to try to spread and it's involving uh, anywhere from one to three lymph nodes in the armpit, the axilla. And so that is the background behind our expander. Uh, we took all women who had a recurrence score in what we called the low or intermediate range and asked if they would be willing to be randomized um, to receive endocrine therapy with or without chemotherapy. And uh, 
over 5,000 women ac across the, the world. We had a big portion of them in the U.S., but we had lots of other countries involved uh, who enrolled in very important ways as well. And what we're seeing at the San Antonio 2020 virtual meeting is the first presentation of the results from our expander. So the, um, what does the, the results that they're going to report today focus on focus on a different a different population still considered early early stage breast cancer both the ER positive which is the most common type of breast cancer could you talk a little bit about who does it what what is this group of patients how does what group of patients are being impacted by um, by these studies by the results presented today and from Taylor X well uh, in the United States uh, you know, between the lymph node negative group and the one to three positive group, this is the, a majority of breast cancer patients in the United States. I mean, about 70 uh, to 75 percent of early stage breast cancer expresses the estrogen receptor. Now, in these studies, we took out the, the HER2 positive um, because we have HER2 drugs and we target those differently. But this is still more than half, uh, if you, especially if you go back and include, you know, the lymph node negative uh, group that was included in Taylor X and now the one to three positive group. This is, this is, you know, the majority of breast cancers being diagnosed in the U.S. It's, this is a big population. And what does, what does this mean for patients? Uh, you, you started out by saying that um, because we didn't know who, who was at low risk and you know, who needed chemotherapy and who didn't need chemotherapy. Now we have a very large group that we can say pretty con with, with strong confidence that they can forego chemotherapy. What does that mean to patients? We know that chemotherapy is an important component of, of cancer treatment. Um, what does that mean for patients who have this ER positive type of breast cancer to be able to go forego chemotherapy? So there's there's two really important pieces to this. So uh, the the first piece is the postmenopausal women. Now we specifically at the time of enrollment uh, asked people whether they were still having menstrual periods. We assigned their menopausal status, and we did what we called stratification for that, so we could account for that, and that we could evaluate that separately at the end. So. So we were looking at whether there were differences in those who were already postmenopausal with no menstrual function at the time of diagnosis or not. In that postmenopausal group, which was about two thirds of the patients in the study, the average age of diagnosis of breast cancer in the U.S. is about 62, and so those are postmenopausal women. Uh, we saw absolutely no recurrence score uh, that looked like it had benefit from the addition of chemotherapy on top of standard endocrine therapy, tar therapy targeted to the estrogen receptor. So whether it was the low risk group or the intermediate risk group, remember the high risk group, we had already decided would not be part of the study because we felt that they did get benefit from chemo. So, so they were not included in this. So for the postmenopausal group, whose tumors express estrogen receptor, but not HER2. And even though they already have some evidence of travel of the breast cancer to one to three positive nodes, endocrine therapy alone, anti-estrogen therapy is associated with a terrific outcome, excellent survival, low relapse rates, and chemotherapy does not improve on that. So that is super important. We can now safely, you know, not give chemotherapy, avoid all of those toxicities in a very large number of women. Now, the other piece of it is in the premenopausal group, which was about a third of the women in the study, um, they uh, actually, there was no recurrence score where we didn't see some benefit of chemotherapy. And that's a very important finding as well that while we can exclude chemo in you know, the postmenopausal group, we need to look in more detail at the premenopausal group because even with a low recurrence score, we still saw some added benefit of chemo. Now, that's complicated because 
one of the most common side effects of chemotherapy in a premenopausal woman is it at least temporarily, if not permanently, makes you menopausal. So is the benefit we're seeing in our expander, in that young group, the premenopausal group, really due to the chemo? And do we really need all that toxicity? Or could we get the same benefit by just shutting down the ovaries, either temporarily or long term? That's a really important question because what our expander did not actually show was the ability to pick that piece of it out. So we've got more, more work to do there. Yeah, so that was gonna be my next question. What, what is next? And you started out by saying these are the first results of our expander. So uh, the study continues, there will be additional follow-up. Um, what, what's next? What are the investigators you know, gonna, be, gonna be looking for next? Well, as you indicate, Margaret, the, this is an early release of the data. We had an independent data safety monitoring committee who's been evaluating this, and this was what we called our third interim analysis, where none of the investigators saw the data, but the small group of people who were there to protect patient safety, actually, they were looking at the results. And at this third look that they did, they said, this is so profound, we think we need to get this information out so we can be using it to treat patients. So the next step, without releasing the data still, was to talk to the National Cancer Institute, who was the major funder of the study, and ask if they agreed with this early release, which they did, and hence this population. So where are we going? It, it is early follow-up. So we need to look at recurrences long-term. We need to look at you know, the, the deaths long-term, make sure that they're still staying low, that this data is accurate. We do know that about 17% of the premenopausal women who didn't get chemo did get ovarian suppression. So we're going to be doing analyses of did they do differently than the group that didn't get ovarian suppression as part of their endocrine therapy. We're going to be looking at a whole variety of other factors using uh, the tumor blocks. Uh, we've got lots of information about the genomics of these cancers. We've got additional information about the patients, too, uh, that we will be following up on. And, of course, additional trials, some of which have started, some of which need to start quickly, will evaluate the true difference between the ovarian function uh, and the chemotherapy effects here. So before I let you go, um, I, I'd like to ask you to comment. You, 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 you mentioned that both of the studies, the Taylor Rx and the, and the Rx Ponder, were National Cancer Institute studies. Um, of course, they provide the, the, the bulk of the funding for these very large long-term studies. But as a BCRF investigator, I, th I think since 2002, and, and you know, uh, the support that BCRF has provided has allowed you to do some of you know, your, your work with the, the SWA cooperative group. What, do, what role does BCRF play in, in the, the efforts of these studies and, and other large cooperative groups that have major funding from, from the federal government, but what does BCRF support um, add to that? The Breast Cancer Research Foundation provides really critical support in these kinds of studies. And it may seem surprising because, you know, the, the, the overall infrastructure of, uh, of the trial is funded by the U.S. government, the National Cancer Institute. But it's, it's not adequate funding to really conduct this trial. We, we just don't have that kind of money. It is expensive to do clinical trials with this kind of data. So, for example, in our expander, um, the, the, the impact of what BCRF contributed was the ability to add other countries into this, because what the NCI mainly pays for are the enrollees in the United States or in a group that's, that's got some complicated kind of affiliation. Um, and so we added um, a big group from Mexico, for example, and getting this assay, the 21 gene assay, shipped and performed in patients in Mexico. We also had big input from France and uh, and Spain, for example. We had Korean participation. So getting these other countries 
uh, to enroll, to get this assay performed, to get the specimens shipped, for example, that wasn't fully covered uh, by the National Cancer Institute. And the BCRF actually covered many pieces of this. Now, why is it important that we had involvement of these other countries? Well, we wanted to get the patients enrolled and the study done sooner. And we also, you know, have the ability to see, is it applicable in other situations as well? So by allowing and encouraging uh, all of these uh, other participants from outside of the U.S., which really was a major part of BCRF's role here, um, we got the study accrued more quickly. We got the answers to the patients faster. And Additionally, it provided for a lot of things that the NCI money just couldn't uh, afford, including a lot of those long-term follow-up questions that we've just talked about, the additional studies, the translational medicine pieces, for example, of what do we do with the specimens we have, all of that long-term follow-up piece, uh, BCRF has been a critical part of. 